So I was going to start out with the, with a, a canned you know introduction that I actually do, but I just want to call out Richard. I don't know if he's still. Oh, there you are. Yeah, crabby old bugger. Um, but a beautiful talk, actually. I think uh, you, you brought out two points that I think that are what I want to reframe and try and freestyle this talk uh, to, to point out. Is I think I actually embrace my stupidity. I'll take both you and uh, John on, on in that. And I, I'm going to demonstrate it right here in front of you. Um, that uh, here I am, I'm a scientist, and I'm here to talk about some of the, the new research we're doing in studying RNA genes. Um, but I didn't have a chemistry kit when I was three, um, never took a science course until college, in fact, barely graduated in high school. Um, and so I think the most important principle that I can have come out of this talk is to embrace your stupidity. I can't put it as eloquently as that. I would say more accept your limitations and try and push them um, rather than saying that we're all stupid. Um, but. Um, the other thing he said is, is this idea of clarity of a landscape, of coming, coming into a new landscape with no perspective. Um, so I came into science through skateboarding. Now, that, that probably makes no sense in how the heck do these, these two things connect. And that's what I'll try and, and bring together in today in telling you the story about how um, our research uh, in the lab has evolved to, to be studying, well, this. It, it's a remarkable spectrum of cellular diversity in your body. And it kind of gives me goosebumps every time I think about this. But the exact same genome is present in every single cell in your body, yet it's alternate shapes and conformations that this genome takes on that will manifest a brain cell, a liver cell, or a kidney cell. So essentially, the genome is a big piece of Play-Doh that you can make into pretty much anything. Um, and I think that's a remarkable power that is now in our, in our grasp. Um, and so what we study is, um, is, it's been a burning question in science to understand how does DNA encode for such a multiplicity of events. And our work stumbled across some obscure um, RNA genes that, that appear to be a different part of this cell circuit, but also help drive and manifest these different cell fate decisions. Um, and so typically we're taught in any general biology course that you have DNA. Is there a laser on this thing? I'm not sure. Um, DNA makes RNA, and RNA serves as a template to make proteins. Proteins run around the cell um, and do their jobs. But um, actually, we've realized uh, recently in, um, that, that RNA actually comes back and works on DNA, and also protein comes back and works through RNA to work back on DNA. And since DNA is this Play-Doh we want to start shaping, this is a cool aspect to the circuit where we can come back and maybe hopefully one day learn how to, what I like to call, play the genomic piano with RNA. Um, and so this is uh, sort of why is this important or why, why am I talking about this? Well, let's take an example. Um, what's the difference between Saul and Melissa? They're, <laughs> they're, they're both the reason we're here today um, and uh, key drivers be behind Biff. And um, thank, thank goodness for them because I'm having a blast. Um, but Melissa has this trick up her sleeve. She's expressing one of these RNA genes I keep discussing um, called exist. Um, that, there it goes. Um, so this is a, a large RNA molecule. And this single RNA molecule can shut off or wipe out an entire chromosome. Now that's a power to behold. If we could figure out how to reverse engineer this process, um, it would, we'd be able to do remarkable things. Um, Saul and re reverse engineer Melissa into Saul. Um, uh, would be a remarkable feat one day. But it really, the principle is, is there, um, and it's in science right now, um, that, that RNA can influence DNA. That instead of thinking of this forward loop, we can go back and forth um, in this process. And, and it's examples like this that we've, we've now uncovered thousands more of these things um, that I think uh, herald sort of a new paradigm in, in biology. Um, but to me, this isn't innovative, actually. This is obvious. Of wh why wouldn't we study these things if they can do such powerful things? And, and moreover, I, I don't really think of myself as an innovative per person. I've never woke up in the morning, or I don't know if anybody has, and gosh, I feel innovative today, uh, get in my car um, uh, and go to work. But, but to make it worse, as I was mentioning, I was a terrible student. I barely, I mean, I literally had a 1.7, maybe 1.8 GPA in high school. Um, uh, didn't ever think I'd go to college other than it was a great place to go snowboarding and skateboarding. Um, and my parents would be cool with me skateboarding and snowboarding as long as I was at college. Um, 
And so that's why I went to college and um, then found chemistry. And so intriguingly, in, in uh, being able to embrace my stupidity and see a clear whole new landscape that I could go play with and fill in the pieces as, as Richard had talked about, um, was, was the, the, the important chemistry behind how I how got to be doing this research now. Um, and so I thought more about it. I'm like, actually, what, you know, what is innovation or what, what does innovation mean? Um, and so who better to ask than Webster, which has the this, this simple definition, the introduction of something new, a new device, method or device. Okay, great. Uh, what is that? Well, this, to me, I guess Webster approved research is happening in our labs. We're finding new RNA genes and using them as a new application or device in, in the genome. But the more I thought about this, I actually realized skateboarders are probably some of the most innovative people I've ever met in my life. What, what these kids do today is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and if you think about uh, skateboarding as an industry, what has happened is absolutely amazing. When I skateboarded, there was a few bad kids in the block that would go meet up and run around on a curb. Now you've got the X Games, and probably most of you actually even tune in and watch it nowadays. Um, so it's gone this amazing revolution from um, a really an underground kind of uh, bad kid sport or whatever is typically thought of as, um, to a massive industry. And I think science similarly has undergone a the same uh, change in landscape recently. It's been 10 years ago, I think almost uh, to the, in the next couple months, the human genome was sequenced. And that's when I started uh, graduate school. So for me, I got to see a whole new uh, opening of a, like a skate park, if you will, and it was like, gosh, that would be really cool to go ride around in there and see what we can find. Um, so what I want to do today is just draw a parallel between skateboarding and science and actually uh, bring, s it, when, whenever we talk about science or the molecular level, people you know, immediately get scared that it's complicated. It's actually not. Um, it's a very simple process, and I think if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, and, and so I want to sort of break it down into the fundamentals of, of why, what I think it takes to do science and or skateboarding. Or really, I think this is universally applicable to any business or landscape that you're interested in. Um, the first and most important thing is fundamentals. This is um, absolutely critical, even though I didn't know a thing about a textbook in high school, really, other than it was heavy stuff I had to put in my bag to pretend like I was, I was at class. Um, that in skateboarding, I spent hundreds of hours practicing fundamentals. And, and these are really key things you need to learn how to do. And you have to suck it up and say, I'm going to practice this over and over again until it's natural. And you can add it to a repertoire of fundamentals. And that gives you perspective on a landscape. The more fundamentals you have in your pocket, the more sort of areas of the landscape you're willing to navigate or bigger tricks you're willing to try in a skate park. And then the key thing is linking these things together for an application. I guess Steve Jobs would be happy to know there's an app for that, even innovation. Um, but this is high risk. Anytime you try and do a new skateboard trick, most likely you're going to break something, uh, hurt something. Um, and same in science. You're going to be spending a lot of time working on your experiments, and something's not going to work. Often, many times, it won't work. Um, and, that, and that hurts a little bit. Um, but this is a, an evolving process, and this is why I think uh, the skateboarding industry particularly has grown so fast, is that once something's a new linked application or somebody's like, oh, wow, that won the X Games last year, that's a f immediately a fundamental the next year. Um, and then that fundamental gets pushed through this cycle again to, to learn a bigger part of the landscape and then develop a new trick. Um, so I think in the snowboarding one, the, the Big Mac was the new trick this year. Um, absolutely ridiculous. Never would have guessed that was possible um, three years ago, let alone uh, uh, last year. But the funny thing was is he did all the winning tricks from the past three years in a row to lead up to this new trick. And I think it's just a good example of, of what we need to do in our business landscapes is as soon as something seems new and cool, make that a fundamental, push it through the cycle. Um, and so in skateboarding, the fundamental is the ollie. You have to learn how to pop up a skateboard, land back on it, and keep your balance so you don't fall back and hit your head on whatever you're jumping over or off of. Um, and, in high school, I spent hundreds of hours practicing tricks over and over and over and over again. And this is what allowed me to uh, quickly change into science, is that I simply just read textbook chapters over and over and over again. I'd then make an outline, then make note cards, and eventually these things just sort of seemed natural. I didn't really think about them anymore. And I think that's an important aspect in science, too, is you want to get a fundamental wired to the point where you don't think about it anymore. It just becomes natural. It tends to look cooler that way. 
Um, and in college, grad school, and postdoc, I've spent thousands of hours repeating mundane, if you only knew, <laughs> experiments, um, feeling what, what we call the grad bot, where you just sit there and uh, you do things over and over and over again. But you start to build this repertoire of fundamentals that starts to, you get confidence to say, okay, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try and jump a little further. I'm gonna try and link this thing together. And it gives you confidence to do that. So here's an example of what I mean by this is you have to practice your fundamental like the Ollie um, and then apply it to a landscape. So here's, uh, this looks like a good place to eat lunch. In fact, this is where I pretty much eat lunch. Um, but you can see it's also a nice way to say, okay, I've got the fundamental of the Ollie down. I'm gonna come in and try and uh, slide on these benches and, and try and see if I can connect these two things to happen. And then as you build more fundamentals, you can go to different landscapes and start linking fundamentals together. Um, and for instance, in skateboarding, you can start putting multiple tricks together to develop a run rather than just one application. Um, and it feels really good when you sort of connect multiple tricks together. It's actually a little bit of an adrenaline rush in your stomach. Um, and you're very happy. Same thing in science. You connect multiple experiments into a run, it often can lead to a scientific discovery. Whether it be small or large, it takes a linking, a perfect run of linking experiments together to get somewhere new. Um, and so once you have these fundamentals, I think you start to gain bigger perspective of landscapes. You get bolder and bolder and um, uh, better and better in the sense that if you just had, a, as you get more and more fundamentals, you look at a skate park in a way and say, gosh, wouldn't it be cool if I could jump from that ramp to that ramp? And in the genome, we knew about a lot of stuff when the genome was sequenced. We knew about these protein coding genes, and it became cool to say, or, or we had this built up a fundamental repertoire of, of techniques and approaches to say, hey, what about the other stuff? You know, if two to 5% of the genome seems to be important, there's gotta be something in that 95% that, that's worth checking out. That's a lot of garbage to sift through. Um, and so it was the, the sort of boldness of saying, okay, we've got the fundamentals, we can make this leap, we can jump from this ramp to that ramp. Um, let's see how this happens. And, and, and we did that by um, finding these RNA genes and that's the linking of the applications. In skateboarding nowadays, it, you, to, come, to come up with a new trick, you're, you're pretty much crazy. Um, they jump out of helicopters now and land on ramps. Uh, I, it's become ridiculous, and I really, every year I keep thinking, there's nothing more that can happen. Um, and then each year, somebody comes up with a new trick like uh, Sean White's Big Mac this year. Um, and in, in biology, uh, we've, we've come to understand a new uh, phenomena that I think is gonna become a powerful tool um, very shortly. Um, and that RNA genes, or these non-coding RNAs, we call large intergenic non-coding RNAs, conveniently link RNAs, um, that can regulate DNA and sort of tell it what to do. And by binding up with proteins, I'd like to think of it as a genetic air traffic control system, that planes don't know where they're going. It's an air traffic controller that's guiding and manipulating these things. It's the same thing in the cell, that proteins really don't know where they're going most of the time. They're just floating around, bumping around. But these RNAs seem to serve as guidance molecules to get them to their proper destination. Um, and then this can lead to um, the process of multiple different cell fates. So I want to leave you with one sort of last analogy of what we do so you can have, uh, so I can be clear um, on, on what we do and you can go home and tell a story at dinner or something that is, I like to think of what we do as genomic origami. The same way a single piece of paper can be folded in many successive uh, increases or increases in succession um, to get uh, multiple shapes such as my favorite, the paper airplane. The genome is really the same thing. It's a flat piece of paper um, that we can start to learn um, the code behind how it's folded, or we can unfold it and find out where all those creases were, and hopefully one day break a code to, to go back and put those creases together um, and start to develop these uh, uh, different cell types. And really, by digging into the junk regions of the genome, we found um, these new RNA molecules, but how does this apply to you? Why do you care? Why, why should we know this? Well. In consistent with this analogy, we can think of the genome as one of these um, uh, crane dove things. Um, and when disease happens, you can think of a broken arm. You know, the, the, the poor dove's trying to, trying to get around, move around, but it's got a broken arm. If we could figure out where the crease was and design an RNA molecule to bring it back up and get the dove flying again, I think that's where the potential of this type of research 
um, comes from, and it sort of came out of nowhere. It came out of junk regions of genome from a junky student you know, playing uh, skateboarding. But I think if we embrace that we, that we don't know everything and that we know some stuff and we can learn, we can learn fundamentals, we can practice, um, that you can really apply it to new clean uh, slates and change fields and, and seem to have, have an impact on it. Um, with that, I'd like to thank just quickly the people I get to work with every day. Um, talk about delivering happiness. These guys uh, deliver a lot of happiness um, every day in a wide spectrum of collaborators that make all this stuff happen. Um, and this is my group, uh, very small, um, but we're, we, I like small, tight-knit um, groups, and it's, it's a real fun. This is at my parents' house in Georgia for our lab retreat. Um, so science can be fun. It's not totally boring. Um, <laughs> It, it, it's only fun when it's not in the lab, but uh, so, and with that, I'd like to thank you for a session of skating on science. <laughs> <laughs>